Father, Lord. We do thank you for allowing us to come into your house, Lord, and to learn and study your word. Indeed, Lord, for those that's not here, just touch them in a mighty way. Let them know we're praying for them. Now, Heavenly Father, take this offer which God has to receive. Will you use it in thy will? For this what we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
good or bad, Lord, we just trust you for everything you'll do. And again, Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings you bestow upon each one of us, Lord. And Lord, again, we uh, say thank you. And Lord, uh, as we leave today, let us leave saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray.
wonderful surprise for you this morning. We're going to have somebody to read scripture. Every morning, just about on a Sunday, I say, Jonathan, you're going to preach for me today? You look so good. So today he said, Preacher, I'm not going to preach for you, but I want to read the scripture. I believe God is speaking to this sweet. Amen. And I love him very much, and I know you do too. All right. You want to lay that up there so you can see it? And, and uh, he said he already knew what I was preaching from. All right. I'll hold this if you want me to. Okay.
thank you, Lord, that you can show us through a child that your word is strong. And Lord, we just want to just ask your blessing to be upon this precious family because I know they love the Lord. Now, Almighty God, we just pray that whatever is laid out for Jonathan will be laid out to serve you. And Father, today as we have your word, Lord, let this word be penetrating our hearts as it has penetrated Jonathan. And Father, let everything that we do today be pleasing to you. And Father, above all things, we do come with mercy, asking for your gracious mercy and forgiveness of our sin. And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> well, you'll get that. All right. Amen for Jonathan. Amen. Amen. Everybody give him applause. <laughs> you know, the title of my message is God's Final Word. God's Final Word. You know, the chapter brings us to the uh, final scenes of the great book especially the great book of the Bible, but this book of scenic wonders, and it also brings us to the end of the Word of God. Now, many times I've been with people who were dying, and some of them, they were just out of it, they couldn't speak. Some of them, not so. Some of them, that I can remember the words that they said, it would be their last words. Here, in the end of this particular book, God is speaking his final words. And when it is his final words especially, all of his words should be taken with all delight and all seriousness. But God's final word is come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And his grace is there for you and me. He's telling us that we need to be ready because his final word is letting us know that it's about to come to an end. Now, the Bible opens with God on the scene in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, it says that God created the heavens and the earth. Well, it concludes the same way as God on the scene is in full control of his people. And so he suffered. He paid a price for our sins, and he died. But the victory and the glory are his. He is satisfied. Isaiah 53.11 tells us, he put it like this, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify me, for he shall bear their iniquity. Talking about Jesus paying for our sin debt. Now, I want to go through this, but before I go any further, I want to make a statement about next Sunday. I have been working on a message that I think has gripped me more than any message that I have ever preached. I, I'm not saying this so you'll miss it. I'm just saying to you that if you're not here, you need to hear it by whatever manner you possibly can. Because it's basically going to be the title is, Where Does God Live? You might think you know. But you might learn something from this that is so absolutely just blowing me away. I'm halfway through the preparations of it, and I still got a ways to go, but I assure you that this is going to be a message that you need to hear as well as it is penetrating my heart, and I can't get it off of my mind. I said, Lord, I got to preach another sermon <laughs> this morning, uh, but wow, I cannot believe uh, the things that I'm coming to, and I just ask you, uh, for your sake, for your sake, I say that you need to hear this message. It's probably one of the most important messages, like none of the others important, but it is. But this is so very, very, very important. Now, we come to something that I want to talk about is the river of the water of life and the tree of life. Now, this chapter opens with a beautiful description of the New Testament. Look in verse 1 again. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now there was a river that was east of Eden, and that river came down through the Garden of Eden, but it went out and branched into four different waters. Here, 
This is not what Eden was. Eden was never a water of life. You've got to see here that God is saying to you and I that the water of life is going to come from the throne of God. I, I couldn't help but stop and think about Jim telling me that my brother was a pastor. He was a preacher. And he had preached here uh, at one time. And he had, he had come. He wasn't a pastor here, but he came and preached. And he preached a message that he, he used as an instrument. I think it was the South Fork or the Catawba River. Yeah, he said, and, and Jerry hunted. He, he, was, uh, he loved to hunt. He loved to fish. And so he wanted to find out where it began. And so he went up into the mountains, and it started off as a little stream. I mean, just a tiny little stream. And then it got into a creek, and then it kept going, and then it began to mount until it became a river. Now, it has to have an origin. Every river has to have an origin. It has to have a beginning. Now the river of life has a beginning. It is coming from the throne of our holy, righteous God. Amen. And therefore the river of life is not going to branch out into many different directions. It is one and solely one. And it is probably and will be the greatest river ever not talking about how wide the Mississippi is or how great the Amazon River is or the Nile, but saying to you that the, the, this crystal river is going to be a river of the water of life. Now you have to see here in verse 2, in the midst of the street of it and on the other side of the river was there the tree of life which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. Now Jonathan read that it said for the health of the nation. Now let me tell you something. That is the correct word. You see, in heaven, nobody is going to be sick. There's not going to be any diseases. So there's no healing needed. But for the health of the nation, the health of the nation, we do things when we're not sick to stay healthy. Amen? Amen? And so this is some of the things that God is telling us that we're going to go on. That this is going to be for the health of the nation. Now the tree of life is a fruit tree. Now it's going to be bearing 12 different fruits, kinds of fruits every month. Now it's a continuous supply and an abundant supply. And, and I want you to realize in eternity man will eat and drink, but the menu will be restricted. It will not be steaks or fish or that. It's going to be fruit. That's what God intended Adam to eat when he ate from the, the wrong tree. And you have to understand why. Do you know why back when you were growing up that people say, now the apple is what Eve took a bite of. How many of you ever heard that say me? Well, you see, they got it from this, that the tree of life is fruit. So they were trying to figure out which one it is. So let me say this to you. Not so. But I will tell you this. It is bringing forth that when we're there, that this is going to be fruit. And you say, man, can we not have a hot dog or a hamburger or a cheeseburger or something? I want you to listen to me. God is going to give you a different body and it won't crave hamburgers and hot dogs <laughs> and the fries and the pizzas and the tacos. You say, oh. But I can assure you this. The body that he's going to give you and the food that he is providing for you is going to be more satisfying than anything you have ever consumed because it comes from Doctors tell us what well, they tell us. Scott quit eating them cheeseburgers. Joe quit eating all them tacos. Jimmy quit eating all that fish. And you know what happens? We eat it anyway. And why? Well, our bodies actually are rejecting some of the foods that God has, uh, has allowed us to eat here. But our bodies, our bodies end up in bad health because we did not eat the things we should. And so here we have that we will have a healthy 
body. And that healthy body will be because we're going to be eating from the tree of life, which will bear 12 kinds of fruit. Now the menu is restricted to the fruits. Genesis 1, 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in thee which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for me. Now, that's what he said. He said, in other words, instead of you wanting a steak, you're going to want this fruit. Twelve different kinds. You say, well, I hope I like it. <laughs> I don't have a doubt in my mind you'll like it. If God made it, you'll love every one of them. They won't be a favorite. You'll love them all. And verse 30, And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth on the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. Not only the best drink, but you're going to be getting the best food. In fact, the tree of life bears 12 manners of fruit and produces them monthly. The other day, I had a chance to have breakfast with my brothers. One of them couldn't make it, but the truth of the matter was that we were sitting there and we were talking about his first grade teacher, who was Miss, Miss Carr. And uh, I said, you know, I can't remember who my first grade teacher was. I said, I think it's Miss Roper. He said, no, that's fourth grade teacher. And I said, good memory. So anyway, all right, I had her in fourth grade. And I said, I remember you had a fourth grade teacher named Miss McG uh, Mr. McGill. He said, yeah, that's who I had. And so anyway, we began to talk like that, and I said, well, Miss Carr came to me. She's a precious lady. She, she lived to be 100. And, and at 96, she was still driving. You say, oh, no. Oh, yeah. She was a very good driver. And so she came to me at Dallas Baptist and said to me, I understand you love banana sandwiches. Now, Brett, Jessica, I know you all don't know what that is. <laughs> but trust me, it's delicious. I had a nickname. It's called me Nana. And the reason is that I'd eat four or five banana sandwiches. I would love them. They used to ask my daddy, said, Glenn said, how do you take care of them? He said, all I need is a loaf of bread and Duke's mayonnaise and, and a stalk of bananas. And he's happy. <laughs> well, let me say this to you. She came up to me and said, I understand you like bananas. And I said, I do. And she said, what do you do with them? I said, oh, mayonnaise and bread and bananas. They're just so delicious. And he said, she said, well, Leroy, I want you to try them in another way. And I said, how's that? Have you ever tried them with onions? I said, onions? I can't even imagine putting an onion on a banana sandwich. <laughs> she says, don't knock it till you try it now. I'm telling you that onions. I said, well, Miss Carr, you was talking about, do you know this about me, about me eating bananas? I know this about you. You put onions on everything. She said, I do. I love onions. She said, but will you promise me? that you'll try a banana sandwich with onions. I said, okay, I promise. Well, now let me tell you something about your pastor. I will keep my promise. <laughs> she had been dead about five, six years before I got the nerve up. <laughs> <laughs> and one day I was fixing me a banana sandwich and I remembered what she said. I said, I got to try this. So I put that onion on that banana. And guess what? You're going to say, yup. Man, that's good. I'm just going to tell you. I've been missing something and dreading something, and you wouldn't believe how good that tastes. So I just want you to realize that you probably never combined banana onion and you don't even know what that taste brings. So you're missing things. Now, what am I saying that for? Because the fruits that God is going to provide for you and me, we've never tasted right. before. Amen. So don't say, I don't know if I like them. It'll not be fruits that you have received here because the fruits here rot. Right. These fruits never rot. And so we have to see here that this is interesting. When Adam and Eve sinned, 
by partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, God drove them out of the Garden of Eden. He then stationed an angel there to keep them from going back in. Why? Well, because if they ate of the tree of life after they had sinned, they would have stayed that way eternally. Did you know that if they would have been able to take from the tree of life, that they would have stayed in that eternally? They would have never died. Do you know how many times you dread death and see death as something? Let me tell you something. Did you know if we couldn't die, we would live with this sin nature and this body that we are living in for an eternity? In other words, if you could not die, now before Adam and Eve, our father and mother, ended up sinning, you have to see that they had the perfect body that could live forever and it did not have a sin nature. But once they sinned and that sin nature came in, I want you to listen very carefully. If you want to recognize the scars of sin, it's right out there in the cemetery. Right out there in the hospital. Right out there in the prison. Why would you want to eat from the tree of life, knowing that's in you. That very thing, the graveyard, the prison, the hate, all of these things would never die in you. And there's coming a day when death will set you free from that thing called sin. Death is healing. Death is healing. Does that make you want to go out here and die? No. It makes you want to live. It makes you want to understand that I can live life to the fullest. Because I know one day, if I've given my life to God, that I am going to live eternally with Him, and there won't be any sin nature in me whatsoever. That's what God's saying. When you drink of the tree of you eat from the tree of life and drink from that crystal water that flows from the throne of God. Now a new day has arrived. The saints in the presence of God and, and may eat freely from the tree of life. The tree plays a part in one's endless existence. And I want you to see for even the leaves contain health for the nation. You know, I personally believe and you may understand this, this is not scriptural and the chances are sometimes I say things that I personally believe, but I haven't just spontaneously, I have meditated on these things, but just as I told you, there's going to be a new body for you when Jesus comes. You're going to be like him, but not as him. Now, those that are going to go to hell or eternal punishment, they're going to receive a body also, but it won't be like Jesus. It'll be a body that never burns up, but will stay in torment forever and ever and ever and ever. And it's going to take with it the soul. What is the soul? Well, the soul itself is nothing but mind, emotion, memory. And so you begin to see that's what it's going to take with it. It's going to take teetotal torment with it for those who are lost. That's why we should be praying for the lost. That's why we should be saying, listen, you need to get ready because Jesus is coming soon. Jonathan read, said, be ready. He's coming quickly. And so we begin to see these things. I personally believe that the bodies of the earth dwellers in that particular time will be different than those that are with Jesus Christ. It never says one time in the Old Testament that their bodies will be like his. In the New Testament, it says that we, the church, will be, have bodies like Jesus. But it doesn't say that about the Old Testament. And so I believe that what's going to happen is those earth dwellers, so we're going to be in the New Jerusalem. And we're going to be up there where the tree of life is, the, the crystal waters is, is, uh, is going to be flowing out of the throne of God. And so these that dwell on the earth are going to come up and they're going to need revitalization. They'll eat of that tree. They'll drink of that water to 
rejuvenate. And so this is just personally what I believe. I believe this because it seems like that's the only answer that it could have when it says that help needs to be given to the nation. <coughs> that help would be <coughs> that it's not going to be a time of idleness. It's going to be a time of activity. So hopefully and prayerfully, we know that God is going to do it all. And there shall be no more curse, in verse 3, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his <coughs> servant shall serve him. Now, the curse originated in the Garden of Eden and was partially removed during the millennium. Now, what do I mean by partially? Again, listen very carefully to what I said. The curse originated in the Garden of Eden, but in the millennium, some of it's going to be removed. Well, what am I talking about? The curse of sin. <coughs> you see, for a thousand years in the millennium, God's going to run here on earth with you and me. And people's going to come out of the, out of the uh, tribulation and the great tribulation. And the devil is going to be cast into a place and locked up for a thousand years. That's why it says partially. But as you know, man don't need the devil to sing. You know, we blame the devil for a lot of the things that we do and we don't need the encouragement from any demon. We just got a sinful name. And we do. We do them because we just crave them. We just can't resist it. We just got to do it. And that's why God is saying to us that we must be born again. That's why he's speaking to us along the matters here. You see, the first creation was blighted by the curse of sin. And this old earth on which you and I live today bears the marks of sinful people. Why? Well, again, like I said, go to the cemetery. You see, sin is a death sentence. And you can't escape it. If you was born from a woman on this earth, I tell you that you have a sin nature. Now, you might wonder now when I say this, why was Jesus born a virgin? That he would not have a sin. That made him perfect. That's the only reason. That he would be perfect. You see, those that are born of woman, as David says, I was consumed in sin. No, no, no. Preacher, my, my mom and daddy were married. They weren't committing adultery. You don't understand, Darvis. Adam and Eve was pushed out of the Garden of Eden because of their sin. Their sin nature now is passed on down through the generation. You see, you might have got your red hair from your grandma. Or you might have got it from a great uncle. You might have got your blue eyes from daddy. <clears throat> or your brown eyes from your mama. But you inherit the nature. And that nature is sinful. And that sinfulness Never needs encouragement. And a lot of times Satan encourages that sinful nature. And that's why sometimes we're overwhelmed. Take the drug addict. Take those that drink alcohol and are addicted to gambling or, or sex and all of those things. You see, we've got it already in us and Satan keeps punching buttons until he, now he encourages it. Now he, he makes it so overwhelming that you just can't help yourself. Now listen, I was watching a documentary on a man who had killed a lot of people. And he seemed like a very nice guy. He was pretty cross. He said, seriously, that's how he was killing? You might know him as Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, he was taken in. Handsome man, very intelligent, been in every society. And when he was asked why he killed, he said, it was an overwhelming urge that I could not resist. Did you know that murder starts with hate? It starts with anger to your brother or your sister. And now, you see, Satan's going to keep pushing it and pushing it. 
until he develops it into a physical word. <coughs> That's why you can't let it lay dormant in you. Because if you do, he'll come and season it. He'll fertilize it. And he'll want to develop it. And those that are trying to resist it as much, you'll find them to be very hateful. <coughs> you'll find them to be in every manner a person you don't like to be around. They're hateful. They they're always seem to be a critical or a criticizer of people. Now, <clears throat> and they shall see his face, verse 4, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Man will at last see Jesus' face. <clears throat> Excuse me. We will be like him, but, Again, what did I say? Not as him. Now, preacher, why would you say that? I'm going to take Jimmy Vernon. Do I have your permission, Jimmy? Yes, sir. Now, I know Jimmy, and Jimmy is a really good, good, hard-working man. I mean, you couldn't ask for better. So when Jimmy dies, he's going to be like Jesus. Everybody got that? Say amen. amen. You can't say amen, shake your head. Now listen. Jesus has his personality. But Jimmy has his. We're going to be like Jesus, sinless, but we're going to be as ourselves with our own personality. Did everybody get that? Amen. Do I need to repeat that? Did anybody miss it? Because there's people that are making that confusion. We're going to be like him, but not as him because we're going to have our own personality. That's what, how good and gracious God is. Do you know that every person in this room has a different personality? The old story is there's no two snowflakes alike. Well, just consider yourself a snowflake, but don't mess with that, okay? So I want you to see that in verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You see, it's not necessary to rest in order to give opportunity to recuperate. You know, I played golf with Jim, and we'd be playing in our younger days, we'd be playing up to 54 holes. We'd play more, but it got dark. Man, I wish it hadn't got dark. We wanted to get even. Now listen. I want you to listen. Man's dreams will finally be fulfilled. 24-7, never have to recuperate, don't need to be energized at all, and it never gets dark. Think about it, ladies. Think about it, men. That's a blessing. Never saying, look, it's, uh, I've got to get home. It's getting dark. You ever heard that? Nah, it ain't going to happen. Well, I, got, I, I better do this or I better do that. I mean, after all, it's going to be dark pretty soon, and I won't be able to do it. You see, what's going to happen is that won't be sunlight that's keeping the light. It'll be the glory of God. When old Paul was on his road to Damascus, he said there was a great light and it blinded him. You know why it blinded him? Because he had sin in his life. Mm -hmm. And the reason he was blinded is so God wouldn't kill him. You know why God wouldn't kill him? Because, you see, he couldn't look upon a holy God and live. Everybody got that mm -hmm. same? Mm -hmm. So he was blind. And so then God sent Ananias to lay his hands on him, and the Holy Spirit healed him, mm -hmm. and he received his sight. Now, let's go on. But not only the tree of life and the river of, of, of life, but the promise of the return of Christ. And he said unto me in verse 6, These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of, of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must be shortly be done. <clears throat> now listen, at this point the angel tells John the reason God uh, allowed him to experience the vision. 
The God of the holy prophets who is truth and cannot lie sent me to tell you that the things you have heard and seen must come to pass speedily. Look at verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. Now, speedily doesn't mean hours. Listen to me. It doesn't mean hours, days, months, or years. What does it mean? Well, we're experiencing signs after signs after signs of the fulfilling of the prophecy that Jesus said would occur before he came. They're unfolding. Now listen. He said, I come speedily, quickly. When you see these signs occurring one right after the other, and when they get faster, guess what? It's like a woman about to have a baby. It's time. Are you ready? God says be ready. You must be ready for the coming of the Lord. You see, there's a lot of people not ready. They're still living in their sins and in unforgiveness, in their gossip, in their perversions of sex and gambling and drinking and drugs. All of these things. And they're not ready. They think they are, but they're not ready. You know, we have to see here these things begin to come to pass so speedily. In other words, be ready. Remember, once the door is closed, it's closed. That's why in this book it says, Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Such an individual will be ready for the Lord's return. This means that no man is to trifle with these words. <clears throat> you're not to add to them and you're not to take away from them. God made that very plain. He said, at the beginning of this book, it speaks of a blessing to those uh, who read it and keep the words and a curse to those who don't. So, verse 8 and 9, let's move on. And I saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of an angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the saying of this book. Worship God. Now let me say this to you here. How many times have you repeated the same saying? How many times have you done the very same thing that you had to ask God yesterday to forgive you for when you did it again? You'll hear preachers say, well, God's going to get you for that. You know, he forgave you. You're supposed to be done with it. I want you to listen to me very carefully. God is a God of mercy and love. I don't tell you to go practice that sin. I tell you just like this. Are you ready for this? I, I know it's getting late, but I want you to listen. Whew. I use smoke. Everybody hear me? Preacher, I just can't see you smoking. You didn't see me as a preacher smoking. Now listen. I quit for three months. When I quit, I wasn't smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. Well, it wasn't long to, ha, man, I ended up going into a bar and all that smoke, and I just, <clears throat> now I'm smoking a pack of A few months went by and I quit again. This time I quit for eight months. When I started back after the eight months, I was smoking three and a half packs a day. Every time I quit, it got worse. Are you getting my drift? Mm -hmm. Then what happened? I quit. I had used patches. I had used, they had these little, uh, little, things, the, the filters that you uh, had different sizes of holes in. Well, I figured that out, so I just put my finger over the hole and smoked it anyway. And so it wasn't no good if you figured out how you, how you can get around it. I'd put the nicotine patch on smoke too. Man, I'm, I, I should have died from over uh, <laughs> nicotine overdose. But what I'm trying to show you here is what I'm making it very, very plain and God is saying, these sayings are faithful and true in the Lord, the God, a prophet sent his angels to show his mercy over John. Why? 
Well, because John had done it again, he had already done it over in the book of Luke, and asked God to forgive him, and he forgave him. He's done it again in the book of Revelation, and God's forgiven him. But this time, John is finished doing it. Sometimes we have things in our life that it takes us a while to stop. We have things in our life that we need to stop. We'll stop and stop. Stop and stop. And you keep trying and God watches you trying. And then one day you just have that determination. You wake up to it and say, I can do it today. And you Satan now is pushed out of the way. The addiction is out of the way. And you challenge everything because you know today you're determined by the grace of God to quit. Now that's the healing. And that's what it's speaking about here. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the saying of the prophecy of this book. Now, and I saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. And then in verse 9, Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. Verse 10, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Now I want you to listen. In the book of Daniel, Daniel was told, Seal up the book. John's told to make sure he doesn't seal it up. <coughs> Why? Because he told Daniel to seal it up because it's not time. He tells John, don't seal it because the time is at hand. What did Jesus say to all the people that he preached to? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm telling you right now that it's coming, and it's coming quickly. Now, verse 11, and I need to move on. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still, which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I'm saying to you, do you know what that word is saying? Choose what you're going to be for eternity. Choose. It's up to you. If you're going to be unholy for eternity, you're going to spend it in hell. If you're going to be righteous, self-righteous, you're going to spend it in hell. If you deserve to be filthy, and the things that's in your mind, and you're not having them cleansed, or not asking God to forgive you, then you're going to stay filthy through eternity. Now, all of this is not going to be an easy task. So that's why you must be born again and now you declare what it says at the end. If you declare and decide to be holy, come to the Lord. And you'll be holy through eternity. You will be righteous through eternity. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The first and the last. Jesus said at the beginning of Revelation, and he concludes with it. He said, I started it and I'll finish it. So, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates of the city. <clears throat> and I want you to, let me warn you here that only a blood-washed believer will have opportunity to eat from the tree that bears the fruit and also the drink from the water that God has supplied. Nobody else. If you don't believe me, you just have to read Ephesians 1, 7 through 12, and I'm not going to take time to do that, but if you keep in notes. And so if you're seeking the rights of, to the tree of life by keeping commandments, by being good, by being a church member, by doing all these other things, i got news for you. You will not see the kingdom of God. You will not. When he talks about by 
by the washing of regeneration, he's talking about being born again. That's what his whole part is here. The water represents the word of God and the Bible will wash it. It has a cleansing power that we know we need. Verse 15. Now you've got to realize something. I'm fixing to read the first few words of this and I have people who love dogs. Got any dog lovers in here? Man, look at the hands go up. Now listen to me. For without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That means liars. People that rather lie than tell you the truth. We have a lot of folks like that in our life. But what about the dogs? I wonder if I see Winky Joe Dinky or Roxy in heaven. That was my two dogs in heaven. Well, when it talks about dogs here, He's talking about the abominable. Who's the abominable? Those who don't believe God's word. Those that will turn around and say, well, God said it's okay for two people of the same sex to marry. Well, it's okay for a woman to choose to abort her child. It's okay for me to go gamble. God didn't say I couldn't. It ain't costing anybody else. Oh, yeah, it is costing God. Why? Well, you have a testimony. And if you belong to him, how come you're using the testimony of the devil? Did you know when you gamble, you're sticking your fist in the face of God and saying, you're not big enough to supply my needs, so I'm going to gamble. So your God becomes something else, not the God of heaven. Verse 16. I... Jesus, now he's taken the name of his saviorhood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to thee again the church, <clears throat> these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Now, <clears throat> the root means he is David's Lord. As David's offspring, he is David's son, the incarnate Christ. That's why, now, folks, if you don't know why, he called himself the God-man. Because of David. Because that was true. Now listen, this is the love and mercy of God the Father as we begin to uh, pull this down and close it. Verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Now the bride is the church. This is a twofold imitation here. Uh, for Christ here to, to tell you to come and, and for sinners to come to Christ. He says, come and let him that heareth say come. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. <clears throat> In this text, God says, everybody is pulling for you. In other words, he's trying to tell you the Holy Spirit's pulling for you to come to, come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord. And the bride of Christ, the church, is saying, come, please come. And third, everyone who hears and believes is saying, we're pulling for you to come to Jesus Christ. And the glorious city of the bride of Christ, the new Jerusalem, is saying, don't you want to make this place your home? Come. Come and let us fellowship together in the Lord. You know, for I testify to every man, verse 18. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Everybody look up here. Do you know why some preachers will not preach out of the book of Revelation? Well, let me tell you why. And I'm talking about a biblical reason. I'm not talking about... <coughs> Somebody said, well, you just can't understand it. Listen to me. He says, if you take away or add to this book, the curse is going to be on you. Now listen. <clears throat> Preachers that won't preach out of the book of Revelation, I wouldn't trust them. Why? Because he's preaching more his opinions and adding untruth to the, the message of God 
And if he preaches from this book, he knows that the plagues of God will be upon him. And that's why he won't touch it. It's because he knows. He believes it. But he stays away from it. He stays away from it because he's going to add his two cents worth to make it fit according to how he wants to make his message sound so good. The word of God is the word of God and truth is the truth. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the word of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It's a strong judgmental, and I mean this, warning from God. God means what he says and says what he means. Verse 20, and we're about done. He which testify these things says, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Now that's God's last promise in the book of Revelation. He said, I'm coming, and I'm coming quickly. I'm coming sudden. And the response of all those who belong to him says, Amen. And those that don't belong to him scream because they know where they are going. Now, Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Grace is still offered to man today. It's God's way of saving sinners. You know, I couldn't help but think of John Newton's song. John Newton was a man who bought slaves and sold slaves. And then there was a great storm, and he thought he was going to lose his life. And he called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered him. And when he got back to a safe place, he wrote this down. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Do you know that every person who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ has their eyes open? They don't see like they've seen before. Do you know when I first come to the Lord, I... I had some guys that I went back, and this is no joke. I said, I am so sorry I mistreated you. I don't ever remember you mistreating me. God, help me. Lord, I want to ask this person over here to forgive me because I I know that I, I wrong them. And when I go, they say, you've always been a great guy. I don't remember you wrong. God had gone before you and moved that unforgiveness from your heart. Now let me remind you, these people were people. Some were saved and some were unsaved. So I cannot tell you what God will do for you, but I can tell you the most important thing he'll do for you. He will save your soul from eternal hell. And the spirit that's dead in you will come alive. Every person who does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, their spirit is dead. Completely. must be born again to receive the love of God. I hope and pray this morning as Scott comes and Kay comes that you'll come today. This is your day to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I pray that you will. Father, we love you and thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, as we've studied this book. Lord, I know it's taken probably a year. But, Lord, what a great year it's been for this. And, Lord, we just seem to be hitting it at the right time as all these things that are occurring is letting us know that you're about to come quickly. Let us be prepared. And this I ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Number 361. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, it's been so wonderful to be back in your house again today and be able to hear your word preached strong and true, Lord. And we know that your word holds truth in the world and in heaven and in our hearts, Lord. And Father, we just ask that you would allow us to take these words that we've heard today and go out into a world that is lost and dying and share them with those that don't know you as Lord and Savior of their life. That, Lord, your family may grow and that we may have another brother and sister in Christ. And, Lord, we thank you for the words you've brought our way today. We thank you, Lord, for the blessings that they hold in our heart. We thank you, Lord, for Jonathan bringing forth the message this morning as well, Lord. Lord, we don't know what you have planned for him, but Lord, we know that you have your hand upon him, Lord. We're just thankful for that. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of life today, all your love and your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we do pray that come quickly, that Lord, this world may one day again know peace that you've created, Lord, in the new heaven and the new earth. And Lord, we give you thanks for all these things. And it's through the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Lord and Savior, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.